Um, there we go. Uh, so today, we're, the way we're going to do it today, uh, Craig and I are going to talk a little bit about, you know, what archery is, you know, where it came from, and why we do it, and what yes. you have as options moving forward. Um, I know it's really, really hot out there right now. It feels like summer. Everybody's thinking fish and the beach and the boat and the lake and all that stuff. But um, archery season is just, it's, it's literally like two months away. And so now's the time to be dusting off the equipment. Uh, now's the time to be getting involved, uh, starting to get your form together uh, and, and practicing. And it's a great way to spend time outside and, um, and yeah, have, have a blast. So um, we're going to go over a couple of quick slides and, um, and then we're going to have a discussion about stuff. Craig, do you have um, anything to add to that? Nope, nope. Let's jump right into the slides and we'll, we'll get things rolling. All right. Sounds good. Um, one moment. Do, do, do. Craig, so, you know, for me, Craig, I, I kind of use uh, July 4th as a, as a trigger. Uh, if I haven't gotten into my bow and, and, and arrows just yet at that point in the year, July 4th is kind of like my hard deadline to be like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta it's time. It. It's, it's time. Um, do you have a, do you have a, a, a mark on the calendar that, that works for you? Usually by mid July, we're starting to talk about getting our archery equipment out. And, um, I'm very fortunate that I've got an archery range in my backyard so we can, um, go out and start practicing, um, you know, and, and come real familiar on on how that equipment's going to shoot uh, for the upcoming season uh, practicing at varying distances and trying um, not only field points but the points that we plan on hunting with and uh, you know shooting your broadheads they they may shoot a little bit differently than your field points so you got to fine tune your bow a little bit more Nice. So why don't we go ahead and jump into that, that first slide. Okay. So can you see the, the bows and stuff there, James? Yep. Yep. Those are up. Okay. So bows date back up to 71,000 years ago, back in the Paleo, Paleolithic period. Um, evidence was found in, in caves and cave drawings that early man was using bows to harvest game. And, uh, you know, they really didn't change much for, for quite a long period of time. I mean, a stick and string. And um, the, uh, the recurve bow, I think was probably the, the next um, major invention that came out in archery by turning those tips outward. It gave a little bit more uh, power to the bow, a little more spring to it. And uh, the one bow that I didn't have a picture of, and James, did you actually get yours with you today? Yep. Why don't you show them that one and tell us a little bit about that. So, yeah, so Craig's absolutely right. I mean, archery is one of the oldest things, oldest ways that um, people have hunted. Um, you know, there, there were hand thrown objects and then there was an invention that actually, um, you know, you stuck at the end of a spear and that gave you a little bit more leverage and a little bit more uh, heft and it's called an addle addle. Addle addle, yeah. Um, and there are actually some states that allow hunting with them. We're not one of them, but um, if you really want to go truly, truly, truly old school, like way, way old school, like before there were schools, old schools, um, you, 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 you look into that, but, uh, archery is a really old form of, of, um, firing a projectile. And, um, I, you know, back when I was a younger man, I, I did Peace Corps and I lived for two years in Mongolia and, um, Mongolians are, um, you know, they, they made a couple of really important contributions um, to uh, to the world's history. I mean, they were they credit uh, as as inventing stirrups uh, on horses, and um, their bow technology at the time was light years ahead of anything anybody else had. And I actually got into uh, Mongolian archery. So this is 
This is my bow. I'll back up a little bit. And it's it's a recurve bow. So when this is strung, these these green tips actually bend all the way back until they're kind of pointed um, up at the sky and down at the ground, similar to how that recurve is is shown there in that picture. Um, but it's it's a composite bow, which means it's made up of multiple materials. There's wood, and then there's a dark area that I may not be able to show without destroying everything. There's a dark area in the middle here, and that is bone or animal horn, and then there's more wood on the other side. So the, the materials that they used uh, were more advanced. The design, that recurve design was more advanced than the European longbows. The fact that there was that horn in there that made it stronger to pull, which meant that there was more energy there, which meant they could actually shoot farther. Um, and it's just, uh, it's a very different, style of archery the western finger drawing usually is, involves three fingers and you anchor on your cheek the mongolian or asian style you use your thumb it's a single point of release and instead of anchoring on your cheek because you're using your thumb when you're using three fingers you have to have wrist alignment you have to have a straight arm when you're using your thumb you can actually cock that wrist and draw back further um, and so they would they would actually anchor behind their ear instead of being up here. And that is a short amount of distance. But when you're talking about the energy you're putting into a, a compound bow or a composite bow, I should say, it makes a big difference in the, in the distance you can shoot. So there's there's a lot of old stuff that's out there. Um, one of the things that's intriguing to me about archery is there's always somebody out there that's doing it more difficult than you are all right like so the the, the folks that are hunting with crossbows you know the, the compound bow archers look at them and say well we're using vertical bows and we're real archers and then there's the recurve shooters and they're going well we're we're not using compound bows we don't use modern technology we're we're real shooters and then the long bows come in and say well these are truly primitive old school bows we're, we're really doing it and somewhere out there there's a guy who's making his own arrowheads out of flint and and lashing them to wooden arrows with sinew and you know there, there's just always there there's so many levels that you can plug into here that if you're really out there for the challenge if you're really out there to get back to the original form of archery that's perfectly possible all the way up to the most modern space age engineering and, and materials to, to do this stuff. So. It's and really cool and stuff. I know a couple of guys that still hunt with a long bow or a recurve bow. Uh, I know of a couple of guys that have made self bows where they got a piece of Osage orange and they carved out their bow and tied a string to it. And, um, and that's great. But when you're starting out, I mean, a lot of us probably shot a recurve very similar to the picture in a phi ed classroom back in the day that's what what i started with and uh oh about 15 years ago the minnesota dnr started a program called archery in the schools and we have a program that helps schools get archery equipment and we provide the training to the to the staff uh, the kids learn basic archery skills on the brightly colored bows um, Everybody shoots the same arrow. And uh, after that in school introduction, the kids start their after school club and they have competitions, you know, locally school to school. They have regional tournaments, a state tournament. Um, and if they do well at state, they can go on to nationals. And uh, if they do well at nationals, they get to go to the world tournament. And that archery program has spread all the way to Africa, New Zealand, Australia, <clears throat> several European countries. And uh, about a year ago, they introduced the program in Mongolia. And, um, you know, it, it, it gives uh, the, the kids a chance to, to learn archery wherever they are. They all shoot the same equipment. So it really levels the playing field. Uh, right now, there's more kids involved in archery in the nation than Little League Baseball. And uh, we're pretty proud of that connection that we've had with the kids. Um, 
the bow next to it is more a modern hunting bow. Um, it uh, has the the idler and the cam wheel. The the cam is where the bow gets its power from. Uh, where the more traditional bows, the power comes from the limbs of the bow. Um, these ones do flex on the modern compound, but um, you know they're uh, there. There's a lot of power stored up in that cam when the arrow is released and most of the shooters of those if you notice there's a little d ring down on the very center of the spring that's where they'll hook their release in and they've got pin sights on them so you can sight in at 10 20 30 40 yards uh, my personal recommendation is take a paper plate and practice at 10 yards and when you can keep your arrows on that paper plate then add another five or ten yards and practice at that distance until you're comfortable in, in shooting. And, you know, there's a lot of people that just enjoy the recreational value of, of shooting an arrow. And um, pretty soon that leads to, well, can I shoot as well as someone else? And you might join a local league and compete there. And then there, for some people, the, the urge to, you know, could I hunt with this? And have you hunted with your bow much in Minnesota, James? Uh, my, my hunting bow. Yes. I've been out, uh, um, a few times now. I, I haven't gotten one yet, but I've, I've been out there. We, we are really fortunate cause we have, uh, turkeys that we can hunt with our bow. Um, and if you're a turkey hunter and you use a bow, you can hunt the entire season, which gives you a lot of opportunity to get out there. Uh, if you're a deer hunter, you've got a very long season, starts usually around the 15th of September and goes all the way till the end of the calendar year. Uh, so you got a very long period to be out there with your equipment. Uh, and there, there's nothing like getting out into the fall woods after that first frost and the bugs are down and the leaves are all turning color. Um, I have a tendency to end up just watching nature more than seriously thinking about you know bow hunting and that's about the time something will walk by and it's like oh i wasn't even ready yet um you know and then we we also have black bear and you can hunt black bear with archery equipment uh we have an elk season if you're lucky enough to be drawn for one of the elk tags you could hunt an elk with a bow and uh back when we had moose season you could even hunt moose with a bow and arrow if that's what you choose to do so the nice thing about those brightly colored bows, and I've got one here, is these are set up for both um, youth and adult shooters. It has what's called an infinite draw. And if you get a chance to go to any of our state parks, they may have an archery in the parks event going on. Um, so it's fourth grade and up. So fourth grade through adult can uh, shoot these bows. And um, this one here happens to be a left-handed bow. And the reason I know that is the way the handle's set up. So this one I would draw back to my left eye. And we haven't really talked about eye dominance, but you know, there's a simple test. You make a circle with your hands and you look through the hole with both eyes open. And as I pull that back, it's coming to my right eye. So I'm a right-eyed shooter. If it came back to my left eye, I'd be a left-eyed shooter. And um, it's, it's kind of funny when I tell a parent that, well, your son or daughter is going to be a left-eyed shooter. Um, well, it can't be. And it's like, I've done this test on, you know, third graders and younger, and they make the circle and they play the game with me and they pull back to their right eye or their left eye. And uh, moms are always like, oh my God, how did you learn that? That's so interesting. And, and dads are, no, no, I, 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 I can't believe my son's going to be a left-eyed shooter. doesn't mean anything's wrong. It just means that's the way they're going to shoot their bow or their gun. So once you figure that out, then you can get into the this type of bow that is best going to fit your needs. Um, we've got a lot of places here in Minnesota where you can purchase archery equipment. From the big box stores to the mom and pops, the local hardware store might even carry some archery equipment. So you can find a lot of different things out there to, to fit your need. The nice thing about going to a archery shop or a box store with an a archery division within it is they're going to help you find the bow that's going to fit your needs. And, um, you know, if you want to be just a target shooter, they'll set you up with target shooting. If you want to be a, um, 
a hunter. They'll help you set you up with a bow that'll that'll work for that. And te technically, a hunting bow will shoot uh, target archery as well as as being a hunting bow. And it's usually the camouflage pattern that they put on it. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide, James. Uh, Craig, before before we um, before we do that, I just want to. This is a really great slide because it kind of, you know, the bows are different shapes because they. The whole point of a bow is to transfer energy to the arrow. All right, so you're pulling back on the string, and you're bending limbs. Mm -hmm. Now, the longbow is the simplest, where it just goes from straight to being bent, and all of that potential energy is then transferred through the string to the arrow, and it fires out. The recurve does the same thing. So when you pull back both a recurve and a longbow, if it takes 40 pounds to pull that bow, you're pulling 40 pounds the entire time. You're not getting a break from that weight. Um, the big difference between the recurve and the longbow is because that recurve has those curved limbs, you can get the same or more power out of a shorter bow. So it allows you to be more condensed, it allows you to be more concise, and um, it allows you to get more power in a smaller package. The huge difference with the compound bow, which is down at the bottom right, um, you have those wheels and those wheels, because of the way they're shaped, that string is not pulling directly on the limbs of the bow. That, the string is pulling on those wheels. And when you pull those wheels out, because of the way they're shaped, it affects how much force you're actually having to exert to pull them. So mm -hmm. you'll see in that picture, the uh, if you're looking at that image the wheel on the right is perfectly round and all that is is to allow the cable to spin and the wheel on the right is oblong it's got a little bit of a of, a, of an egg shape to it as that string travels over that oblong shaped wheel it changes the amount of force that you need to make it to move and so when you talk about the draw length or the draw poundage of a compound bow, you're usually talking about the poundage that it takes to get it started. And because that force changes as that oblong cam, it's called a cam, as that oblong cam moves, the force is gonna get less. So it's gonna get easier. You're gonna hit a point and it's called the break and you're gonna hit a point and it's gonna go from taking 40 pounds to pull and you might shake a little bit and then it's going to be whoop, and it's going to be really easy to pull back all the way to your ear or wherever your anchor point is and hold it and that's the big advantage of compound bows is that it might take on my hunting bow it takes 60 pounds to pull it um, but it has an 80 percent let off to hold it right so i'm in the team poundage wise for holding a bow at full draw and so that gives you a huge mechanical advantage it does it means that you're not sitting there because your arms are going to get tired. You're not sitting there holding back 80 pounds. But when you let go of that arrow, 80 pounds worth of energy is going into it. So, or 60, I should say. I'm not shooting mm -hmm. an 80 pound bow. That's absurd. Um, but those are the big differences with those bow types. And that's that's what that means. And and you talked about the, the anchor point with the brightly colored kids bows. We use the corner of the smile because that doesn't change. When I shoot my hunting bow, I've got a shape with my hand and that tucks right in on the backside of my jaw. And then my trigger finger would release the, the arrow or release the string and fire the arrow. Um, but you wanna find something that you can repeat, go back to every time. So like I said, you find the corner of your smile with uh, the smaller bows or even the, the recurves. And um, is that any better, guys, if I move it over? Okay. So you can, uh, um, you can repeatedly go back to that part of your job or smile because that really becomes your, your rear sight. Because if I continually move that around my face, it's going to change the pitch to the arrow on the rest and it's going to shoot to a different spot. So if you can come back to that corner of your smile or the curve of your jawbone, you're going to have um, repeatability that, you know, when I release my arrow, it, it's going to go into this area of the target. 
And um, you notice that the, the brightly colored bows, they come with no front or no sights on them. So the kids learn instinctive archery on, if I put the tip of my arrow on this part of the target, it should fly into the center. If, uh, if I hit low, I got to aim a little bit. Higher. And we haven't had a 300 perfect score yet, but we've had a lot of 298s and 299s. So we're right at that cusp of being able to, to shoot a perfect round with uh, the kids from fourth through 12th grade. Yeah. Let's, uh, um, let's, uh, so let's I, I think that, that covers those. We're, we're not really covering a lot on sites because um, that, that, that's just not, okay. So James mentioned crossbows earlier and we do have a crossbow allowance in the Minnesota statutes. Uh, what it says is if you have disability, um, you can get a doctor's uh, order and you can hunt with a crossbow or if you're 60 or over. And, you know, I'm getting closer to that 60 number every year. Um, it's getting harder to pull back 60 or 70 pound bow. And uh, I've got a bad rotator, so it, it just makes things more challenging. And it might be a direction that I go, you know, in the near future to, to be able to continue to get out there and and, and hunt more and it, it's a personal choice you know um there's a line drawing down here and that was done by da vinci so you know, he was he was thinking about how to improve the the sport of archery and if you notice the old wooden one and da vinci's bow they were a recurve style crossbow all the tips kind of swing out the picture of the more modern crossbow that's got um uh, the pulleys on it, the cams. So you multiply the power of what that cam is going to do. Um, but it's still, you know, a 40 yard uh, piece of equipment. Um, you know, you got to get a lot closer with archery and crossbow than you do with a high power rifle. Okay, yeah. let's go on to the next one. Absolutely, and that's that's always one of the funniest things. Whenever I watch um, old, you know, movies or games, Game of Thrones, there was, there was a big fight scene in Game of Thrones where you had armies lined up like football fields apart from each other, and the archer, the archers, loose their arrows, and it rains down on the other side, and it's just that's way too far to cover to cover that distance. So, we, um, um, I was going to say, when we teach the archery in the schools, that's one of the. Uh, areas that archery can be taught in is history because what was the one tool used by the Roman legions to conquer the the Roman Empire and it was archery equipment and that history comes alive because the kids were just out on the gym and, and got to shoot a bow and arrow you know so the bow itself has to launch something and uh, in the case we have um, you know just your basic arrow and uh, they can be made of wood, they can be made of fiberglass, they can be made of aluminum. Uh, this happens to be a carbon arrow, so it's very strong. Um, the, the fletching type, now this has the plastic veins on it. You got real feathers on, on James. That's what stabilizes the, the arrow in flight. The, the shaft of the arrow is still the shaft of the arrow. And uh, the type of tip or point that you put on there could be a broad head as described in the picture or a practice point and um, there's just a, a huge variety of of uh, choices out there um, you know and I'm, I'm not going to mention brand names but um, I've used both fixed and mechanical blades and and uh, had good results with both. So I'm not gonna pick one over the other. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about is this little guy. And this is called a bolt. This is what the crossbow would fire. It's still got a knock on the back that the index vein sets down, the string catches in the knock and launches the arrow off the platform where the more traditional bow has a that clips on the string. And, um, you know that's how they 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 grab the energy of that string and and launch that projectile that arrow out. Let's go to the next one. And I, I think it's important to note that 
you know, all of the components of the arrow, that's customized to the application that you're using. Um, you know, the fletching that we were just talking about. Um, if you're just getting into this, you're going to see some some arrows that have this really, really fat four to six inch wide fletching. Um, those are typically used for arrows that are for small game hunting or bird hunting, um, mm -hmm. because those distances are going to be a lot shorter. That fletching helps the arrow stick out. You can find the arrow easier that way. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a different application. The heads that you're going to be using, whether it's a broad head or a practice head or a field tip, um, you know, all of that is going to be dependent on what your application is. And um, I practice a lot. I don't have a, an outdoor range like Craig does, but my basement's big enough that I can get a 10 yard shot if I angle it the right way. And so I use, I use uh, my practice, my field points in the basement, my 10, in my 10 yard little range, little shooting lane. Um, and, um, you know, if, if, if your basement's big enough, I highly recommend putting up some sort of backstop because uh, an arrow going into a basement wall is is a it's not a pretty sight. So yeah, pretty much ends that. And my my wife bow hunts with me, and um, when we built the house, we built the garage long enough to have a ten yard range, so we'd have to back all, all the vehicles out, but we can stand out in the garage and uh, and shoot. So you know, it was just something that that I planned for when we were building the house, and um, so those January days when it's way too cold to get out there and shoot your bow, um, you use a whole different set of muscles when you pull that. Um, so it's it's like you got to kind of work with those muscles every once in a while once you get them developed or they atrophy and you you when you go to pull your bow out in July, it's like, oh my God, how do I get that thing to move? Early on, Jay mentioned uh, somebody was making flint napped arrows out there. And um, so there's an example of a flint napped arrow. And uh, we were talking yesterday in our practice session. Um, I said, when did the, the steel age start? And what was your answer? Um, after, after the bronze age. After the bronze age. <laughs> yeah. So we. Um, I don't know exactly when they started making projectiles out of metal. You can see this one has got like a sinew wrap that holds the arrow onto the shaft. And the broadheads that James was holding, they screw into the end of the arrow and uh, much easier to change your, your point out if, um, you know, something happens. Um, there's some practice points on the bottom here as an example of the the wood shaft that you just glue that on that would be your your practice arrow and then um, the multiple ones those are field points and um, you know you can match the weight of your, your field point to the weight of your broadhead and uh, that way when you get your bow and make the switch from practice to hunting. You've got that one element taken out of there so that your arrow is the same on either side. Broadhead, I've actually seen them catch the wind on those and move and go to your intended target. The the last one there with the, Craig, the little wire the bend through the bottom it. Right. Yeah. That's the one I was going to talk about out there. It, that's a fishing point. So you can actually use a bow in Minnesota to bow fish for. Uh, uh, and James laughs at me when I talk about rough fish, but you know, suckers, carp, um, those time types of um, fish, there's a legal season that you can go out and harvest them with your bow and it's a lot of fun. But if you've ever stuck a stick into the water, you notice how it, it moves because the light doesn't uh, penetrate the same under the water. So you actually aim below your fish. There was a lot of fish that I shot over when I was first learning how to how to shoot a bowfish uh, or bowfish with it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, that was the last slide. Um, let's jump right into the questions because we're about 1232 here. And uh, in the chat, I, I'm seeing a few questions pop up. Um, 
One person said I have a stronger left eye, uh, more for distance, but not training myself to reverse. Um, so if you're a left eye dominant person, you should draw back to your left side. And I have saw a technique. You take scotch tape and you'd put it on your left eye. So a, you're forced to focus with that right eye. So just a pair of shooting glasses and put that um, scotch tape on there. If it's fuzzy, you can't, um, you know, draw your attention to that eye. And you can work with it and, and train yourself to shoot. It, yeah, that's possible. You could also go with the very envious uh, fashion statement of just wearing an eye patch. Um, um, just, just we're trying on the volume. Patch it over. So, um, yeah, eye dominance. Yep, that would work. You too. know, it's one of those things. Um, it, it affects whatever you whatever you're shooting. You're going to need to know your eye dominance. Um, and there's, like Craig said at the beginning, there's ways to test for it. Uh, and then you have the choice of do you fix the hand that you shoot with or the eye that you shoot with. And my experience has been that it's easier to shoot. Um, it's easier to to fix the eye that you shoot with um, because you you by the time you're an adult, you've just got so much muscle memory in that hand dominance, mm -hmm. and your brain will will um, correct your eyes quicker than they'll correct the motor the motor skills in your hand. That's that's my experience. I'm not a I'm not a physician, um, I'm not a I'm not a neurologist, but that's just that's what it's felt like for me. So one of the things that I've noticed is that um, you know if if they're drawing back to the to the right side and they're tipping their head to look with their left eye, or they're firing uh, a 22 for the first time and then roll that head over. Chances are that left eye is their eye, and it's sometimes easier to correct when they're young. Um, I, I sat on the line with my my nephew, and every time he'd want to roll his head over, I'd, I'd touch his cheek to do this one, and now he's a right-eyed shooter. So you know, there there's ways that just practice can get you there. Uh, we had a question, James, yep. on a, a middle school, and they're wondering if they have a shooting program. And from where I'm at right now, I probably can't, but Martin, you've got my phone number up on the screen there. Um, feel free to give me a call and uh, I can look that up. I wouldn't know if they have a shotgun program, but I could probably tell you if they had a uh, archery program or not. And somebody was asking where to shoot in Minneapolis. There are ranges all around the state. And um, we did some archery grants uh, early on, and we built some ranges in St. Paul and Minneapolis, um, not far from from downtown. Um, out at the water tower was one that we built, and uh, you can search online just you know archery ranges in whatever your area is, and there should be a, a list that populates up, and. Um, the ATA used to have a pretty good website that you could ask that same question, put in your zip code, and it would tell you the ranges in your area. Um, those are going to be outdoor facilities, but a lot of the, the pro shops have um, indoor ranges where you, you can, you know, sign up for for practice and go out there and do a lot of shooting. So it, it makes a pretty enjoyable afternoon or you know after dinner time you can go out and shoot your bow a little bit and instead of turning the tv on and putting your feet up you can go out and shoot some arrows and any and questions some of, the, in uh, some of those ranges you know it's it's not just shooting at flat targets um there's 3d archery ranges that are out there that's a lot of fun it's a lot more um you know they you're not just standing at a fixed point and shooting at a flat target you're walk you're walking a course kind of like a golf course and there's different pitches there's different scenarios there's different shooting scenarios and they have 3d targets of of the critters some of them are big like i've seen moose bison and elk Mm -hmm. And I've seen um, mosquitoes and grouse, so they can be big, they can be small. Um, some of the times there's a platform you've got to go up into, so it can be it can be a lot of fun. Um, and if you've got a buddy that you're competitive with, like like I like I've got one. Um, you know, we we 
it, it gets a little tense at the end when we're when we're close to each other because we, we both want to outshoot the other person. So um, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, any shooting clubs in Minneapolis? Um, that's uh, there are a lot of private conservation clubs that are around um, that are nearby, and they many of them offer archery shooting and archery shooting leagues. Um, so I would yes, they they are around. Um, I would I would go online and um, and do some looking um, to, to to find I know. the. the the ones that are closest to you. Some of the, the community park and rec programs around the area. Um, there there was one in South Metro, um, Three Rivers Parks had a, an archery range as part of their uh, opportunity. There was one up um, in Woodbury area. And so there's some community park and rec programs. So you might want to just check with, you know, park in your your community park and rec department in your area to see what they've got available. Uh, we got a question. No, I was Go just going to say last little bit. There are there are public ranges that are out there. Um, there's one by the Region Three headquarters uh, here at DNR yep. over by Pig's Eye yep. Lake, and you know it's it's nothing fancy. You're not going to get a bottle of water or, or uh, Coke or Sprite while you're shooting, but you know you've got measured distances to the targets, and and you can um, shoot arrows with uh, with um you know in a, in a safe environment and we're getting a note in the uh, chat that there's an archery range at worth park by the gar golf course um so and, and honestly i mean i'm still fa fairly new to the state so i'm also looking for stuff i've only been here about three and a half years so i'm still exploring and um doing a, a search in google maps has has found me several um uh, archery ranges that are near me so just opening up google maps and Typing in mm -hmm. archery range, and and it's, oh, you'll get a lot of stuff come up. So transporting your bow, um, if you're going to drive from your home to a a park like that, you're going to want to case it up. Um, I've got a soft case that just zippers shut, and I can put my bow in there. And I've also got a hard case. So if I'm traveling a greater distance, or perhaps even by uh, airplane, that I can put that bow in his check on luggage and uh, it protects it that way. So make sure you, you know, have some way of transporting that bow. Um, it's a lot like uh, transporting a firearm. You got to have it completely encased and snapped, buckled, zipped or tied shut. Uh, we got a question in Q&A, James. Um, what recommendations would you have for affordable ways to get started using equipment? Uh, I'm interested in shooting at the range and the park near me, but not ready to commit to buying a new bow and all the attachments. And when when you go buy a used bow from somebody, um, you'd want to know what your draw length personally is, because if you go buy a bow and it's um, not adjustable to your length, you're, you're going to have a piece of equipment you're not going to be able to use. Um, you know, the way you'd like to. Uh, some bows are adjustable and and you'd want to make sure you knew that before you laid down good money. Uh, chances are the, the mom and pop pro shops might have advice on, on a used bow. Uh, a lot of times they'll let some of the shooters hang up a card that, you know, this is the type of bow I have. And there's there's so many different brands out there. I, I can't really pick one and say this is the direction that I would go. Um, but you know, you're going to find something that that you find appealing, you know, visually, uh, you're going to find something that physically able to manipulate. Um, my bow goes up to 70 pounds. And when I got my shoulder hurt, I found out I couldn't pull 70 pounds anymore. And um, so that was, that was kind of like, okay, now I got to drop this thing down as low as I can get it. So I can still try and try and draw that bow. Um, so finding a, a used bow is possible. And I don't know what style you might be thinking if you want to recurve, if you want to compound, um, you know, maybe even one of those little bows would work really good while you're going through those learning stages. And if you got kids at home, mom and dad can share the same bow while you get the, the technique down and then advance to a, a higher poundage hunting bow. 
that would be my recommendation there. So, so, and I just want to build off of that. Um, you know, I, when I got into archery for hunting, anything uh, from you? Was when I was living in Wisconsin and I was a grad student, I did not have a lot of money to throw down on this stuff. Um, it is possible to get used equipment. Uh, one of the nice things about archery is that, you know, every year there's a new design that comes out every year. There's a new manufacturer that is reinventing the bow and people get excited about it. And so there's a lot of turnover in the archery world. I would say more so than in the, um, than the gun world. And if you go to those conservation clubs or the, the local shops, the, the bow shops or the, or the outdoor stores, sometimes you will see, like Craig said, you know, notices of, of what, you know, people are trying to offload. They're trying to sell their old equipment so they can get that next big new thing. Um, my recommendation, step one, go to a pro shop. Don't buy anything. Just go to a pro shop and shoot several different brands. Mm -hmm. Okay. Find the brand that feels good to you. So when I was starting out uh, back as a grad student, I went I, at the time it was the only shop I could get to. It was a it was a big box store, and I went through about four or five different major brands because they they design mm -hmm. their equipment differently and it feels differently as you pull it. So when I when I talked earlier about you know, when you're, when you're drawing a compound bow, you know, where that let off occurs and how abruptly it occurs and how easy it is to stay pulled all the way back. Those are all going to be different between the different brands. So go to a local shop or go to a pro shop, shoot, a, shoot as many as you can, as many as you feel like, find the one that feels good. And they're going to help you out. They're going to tell you what your draw length is. They're going to ask you what your, your what your applications are for, because that's going to affect the speed of the bow, uh, the poundage of the bow, and those two things are gonna affect the kind of arrows that you're gonna buy. And they'll talk, they should, they should, if they're not talking to you about this stuff, go somewhere else. Um, but, but get a feel for how these different companies manufacture different bows and how it feels. Once you get dialed in on a manufacturer, then you can start looking at used equipment and hone in on stuff. Um, you know, I, I've, I've heard, horror stories of people buying used bows off of Craigslist because it just didn't work or there were flaws or whatever. Um, I've also heard some pretty decent stories. Me personally, I was able to get a, a, a gently used bow off of eBay. It came with sights. It came with, a, it came with everything except a release. It even came with arrows and it was all for like 250 bucks. It's still the bow I'm using today. Um, it's, it does, it does exactly what I needed to do, but I made sure that it had adjustable length. So if the draw length didn't fit, I wasn't locked into using that draw length. I made sure that it had adjustable poundage. And I made sure that the seller took returns. Okay, because if, if, if I found something that wasn't kosher, I was gonna send it back to them. And you know, when, and, and, and so that's, those are strategies that I use that work for me um, and, and I've been, and it's 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 put down it's put down every deer I've I've uh, pointed it at so it, it's a fine bow. My my uh, first bow was bought at sixteen, and uh, it was at a garage sale. the The guy wanted fifty bucks. It had a quiver and three four arrows stuck in it, and uh, so I was asking him questions. Oh yeah, that'll work for you just fine. Well, I got home and I set up a target, and I was all proud that I bought this new bow. And when I went through the draw, I couldn't get back to the corner of my smile. It was like I had my arm a little bit to get back to have my anchor point. And that wasn't good form. And of course, the guy I bought it from, it was, you know, a done deal. It was a sale. He wasn't going to take it back. And uh, I used that for a while, but it's not, wasn't ideal. And, and there's, uh, there's a comment in the questions from, from Lance. He makes a great point. You know, if you do choose, there, there's a often in outdoors equipment and in hunting stuff. You know, you 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 uh, you cry once big or cry a bunch little. Like if you if you pay premium up top, yep. Yep. yes, it hurts, and it, it's going to take some budgeting. Um, but it, that's probably going to be the only time it hurts. If you try to go on the cheap and you nickel and dime it, you have the tendency, and this is happened. Like, my bow was great. All right, I was very happy with that find. I, I'm I'm still using it. I still shoot it. Um, 
I did go cheap on my bow release for my compound and it's, it's, um, I finally upgraded it this summer. I've already noticed a huge world of difference. Um, you know, I, I, it's, um, my groups are tighter They're, My arrows aren't wandering as much because it is a better product. Um, mm -hmm. I was able to get by with a cheap one. It put meat on the table, but I like the, 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 the better one better. Uh, and it's, it's, it's improved my shooting. So, um, you know, there, there, there's always trade-offs. You can find stuff on the cheap, but it's going to take you time and you increase your risk factor. If you pay good money up front for something that's at a shop, um, to Lance's point, that shop is going to take care of you. They're going to make sure that you've got the right draw length. They're going to make sure that you've got the right arrows for the bow. They're going to make sure that you've got the right accessories. Um, I've never, it's, these aren't used car salesmen. I've never been in a shop where they're like, oh, well, if you don't have that $300 quiver, you're just not doing it right. You know, they, they talk to you and um, they should talk to you again. They should talk to you. If they're not talking to you, go somewhere else. Um, they should talk to you to find out why you need this and what you're looking for. And most of them are really helpful. Yep. Um, Lance, you weren't going to shoot. I zeroed in pretty excellent. I just bought an archery set. Any advice to middle aged newcomers? Um, I, I'm not that far outside of middle age myself. I'm still fairly new to archery. The, the biggest thing with archery is consistency for me. Um, you know, Craig and I probably shoot very differently, but the results are, are pretty typical, pretty, pretty similar. Um, you know, my anchor point because because of that Mongolian shooting that I did with with my thumb release. I overdraw for Western style archery. I've been in I've been in more than one shop where the guy's been like, "You're overdrawing that." And it's like it works for me. Well, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> and and then I'll shoot some arrows and he's like, "Oh, okay, well, all right." Um, be consistent. Like when it's a it's a new thing, and so you're you're having to teach your body how to do this stuff. Find those release points that Craig talked about. So because I overdraw. You know, most most got most people that I see when they're shooting, they'll put they'll put the arrow knock in their corner of their mouth, like Craig was talking about, and then that bowstring comes up to to right about their cheekbone or right right next to their eye. When I draw back, because I overdraw, I put my first knuckle into my ear. And that, I know that's not gonna change anytime. Mm -hmm. Um and so that's my anchor point. So find the anchor point that works for you, find what's comfortable, and then practice, 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 practice in your basement, practice and outside. Um, you can do exercises where you just, you're just drawing. I mean, for a while there, I would just draw and just get that muscle memory. I would draw and I would hold because I knew this was going to be a hunting application and it's, it's one set of muscles to draw it back. It's another set of muscles to anchor it and, and keep it held. Be very careful when you do that. Do not, never, ever, 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 ever dry fire your compound bow. Don't do it. You can draw it back and you can let it down, but do not let it go without an arrow in it because they're designed to push something. And if that resistance isn't there, you run the risk of destroying your bow. So be very careful. Don't pull it back and let it go because that could break something and cause injury um but yeah you can practice that stuff they make if, if if you're really into buying stuff they make bow trainers um but you've got a bow in your house and you don't you don't need to buy something like that but getting that consistency that's the biggest tip is find what's comfortable find what's effective and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and that's again something that they can help you with at a shop or if you can find a group of shooters they'll help you out um, find that community that, that knows how to do this stuff because it, you're going to learn a lot. I, um, I had to go to a physical therapist one time for my shoulder and they gave me one of these green elastic, uh, rubber bands. And that's a great way to, to start practicing, getting those shoulders to, to pull and hold, because if I let this go, it, it, it's not going to hurt anything, but. I can build up strength um, in the archery in the schools yeah. program. We actually use a uh, string bow and uh, we teach them how to tie that up so that they can practice their draw, their anchor, their, aim, their shot setup, and their release. And uh, 
some of the schools now have started offering um, through their community ed program, not only the, the youth program, but one night a week, it's a parent child program. And uh, so moms and dads can go out with the kids and, and learn to shoot as a family. And that's been kind of a nice addition to what we were trying to get started with the kids programs. Uh, but my name uh, number was up there on the screen. I hope you had a chance to jot it down. If not, search Archery in the Schools on the DNR website. That'll give you my phone number and my email. And uh, we'll try to get you some information There's, to help you guys get started. Or Yeah, and we're, we're going to wrap this up. There's one more question in the chat. Is there a blue book for used bows? Um, it, I would, I, there are a lot of um, archery. I've never seen it myself. Yeah, yeah. I, the, the short answer is no, but there are a lot of archery specific um, chat boards that you get. There's archery talk, there's, there, there's yep. rock slide, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that's out there with even on Reddit. I mean, Reddit would be a, a good place to start uh, in their archery mm -hmm. um, section um, where you can, you know, ask the community, just be like, hey, I'm seeing this bow for X price. Is that decent? I'm, and if you preface it by saying, you know, I'm a new shooter, I'm trying to get into this, people are usually pretty forgiving and, and you know, they, they want they want more shooters out there because they want selfishly, I want to be able to brag about my shooting, um, but it's more people to help out and, and, and have, have fun with. Um, before we go, you know, archery, you know, hunting, archery, Craig mentioned it earlier, you know, it's with gun hunting uh, for deer, you get a weekend, maybe two, if you're really lucky, you get three. Um, but with archery, you get months, and it's a great time to sit out in the woods. You actually get to see how the deer change over the season from middle of September to the end of December. Um, it teaches you a lot about ecology. It gets you some nice, quiet, peaceful moments. Um, if you go out, please, please remember to be safe. Um, a lot of archers use tree stands, uh, tree stands are a great tool, but most of the injuries that happen over the hunting season, in fact, nearly all come from falling out of tree stands. So always wear safety equipment, always be tethered. Don't ever get into a tree stand without some sort of fall arrest device that will keep you from hitting the ground mm -hmm. suddenly. Um, some of the best advice I've ever gotten is from my personal Northwood spiritual advisor, Craig Kiger, that said, um, you know, don't only climb as high as you're willing to fall. So um, keep that in mind when y'all are out there. And if you're going out early season before the first real frost and before it gets super cold, always be aware of ticks. Always check for ticks when you're coming out of the woods uh, and, and, and be aware of, of what, you're, um, what you're aiming at and what's behind that target. Um, and then I think there's one last question that just popped in. Uh, tips for hunting in December and staying warm. Um, uh, there's a lot of different <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do at, at a certain level you're just going to have to learn how to be cold but you know it's like how cold is cold you know there's I'm a big fan of um, chemical warmers that go into my boots my mm -hmm. you know I've gotten some frostbite damage on my feet so my feet cut out pretty quick um, these days they're making electric inserts and and battery powered socks um, they actually make these um, they're basically a wearable sleeping bag with armholes that you can like mm -hmm. just zip up and be completely surrounded by fabric and cocooned. And then when a deer comes along, you can just like unzip them really quick and pop out. Um, and they make those in camo and blaze orange and, and, and what have you. So um, mm -hmm. always layer up, um, you know, avoid cotton. Uh, I'm a big fan of merino wool. Uh, because it's expensive, but uh, it lasts a while. Um, I've had the same merino wool base layer for years now, and it, it lasts a while, and it, it just does so good at, at keeping me warm. Even if I work up a sweat or if it gets a little warm out there, it, it regulates really well. Craig, you're 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 the you're the Northwoods um, Jack Pine scholar. Like, what do you, what do you use to stay warm? I mean, and I, and I won't tell them about the buddy heater you keep in your blind. You do. <laughs> I was going to say an enclosed blind uh, with a buddy heater is kind of the direction I went. Um, you know, the older I get, the more comfort I want. But um, 
I think James is spot on. You know, uh, the old timers talked about, you know, wool and and feathers to keep keep you you warm and the wool keep you warm even. So a lot of my hunting clothes, I have wool. Uh, I have some uh, wool, uh, um, garments. Uh, I, I may even have a pair of um, um, and <laughs> the older I get, more. Uh, Craig, you're, you're breaking up on, a, on us, buddy. Um, but you, yeah, your video is locking up. So and participate. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, um, Lance asked a question. Um, yeah, yeah. Craig's Craig's on his on his backup solution because the office is shut down today and his internet's down, so he's having to use the internet from home. So I apologies for any garbledness or or slow video. We're going to be wrapping it up here. Um, there's one last question from Lance. Uh, my dot sites are generally like 10, 20, 30, or does that depend on the archer? Um, where you put your sites is, is very dependent on the archer. Um, you know, how far out you're going to be going. I don't take a shot uh, beyond, if I'm hunting, I don't take a shot beyond 30 yards. It's just, I don't have the consistency. I don't have the um, precision that I really would have for my personal self comfort. So I've got, but I have a five pin site and my pins are at 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Uh, because I'm using those farther distances when I go sh target shooting and between 10 and 20, there's really not that much difference from my shooting style um, to, to notice to, to warrant enough um, of, a, of a pin at 10. Um, but try it out, see what works for you and, and find out what what, what happens. Um, we're, we're at we're right at one o'clock. Uh, we started uh, one minute late, so we're, we're coming in one minute early. Um, and I just want to say thanks everybody uh, for for coming in. Thanks for talking archery with us. We got another class next week, um, and uh, keep tuning in to these outdoor skills and and stewardship series. We're going to be doing it through the end of the year, and hopefully there's going to be tips. Hunting season's right around the corner. It's coming up, so get out there, start practicing, find out what works, and uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks everybody. We're going to shut it down. Thanks, Craig. Appreciate it.